thank you everyone for for joining it's a timely discussion we have our governor lieutenant governor that have made this their top issue and we're frankly seeing them trying to capitalize on the COVID-19 public health care crisis uh, with promises of profit you have governor wolf making this his top legislative agenda item lieutenant governor fetterman has made this his top issue since day one in office and there are some states that have experimented with legalization and lieutenant governor john fetterman has pointed at the state of illinois for the gold standard for Pennsylvania to follow, as well as Colorado to go full on Colorado here in Pennsylvania. And I'm, I'm thankful that the two expert guests we have are, are representing both of those states. We have Dr. Aaron Weiner, licensed clinical psychologist in the state of Illinois, as well as Luke Niferatos, the executive vice president for the national group Smart Approaches to Marijuana, and he's based in Colorado. So gentlemen, certainly thank you for, for joining this and uh, welcome, welcome both of you now. My pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. Great. Well, Do Dr. Wine, I I'd like to start with you. And really, I guess just what is it about marijuana drug policy that has really drawn your attention and, and your, your focus over the last few years? Yeah, well, so I, I have spoken out about this uh, for, for, for probably about four years now. And really grateful to have uh, Sam as an ally in this, in, in this fight. You know, honestly, I so I'm an addiction specialist. I treat addiction for a living. And one of the greatest injustices of all of this is that marijuana corporations right now are selling people a, a bag of lies, honestly. They're, they're pulling the wool over the eyes of the American public, uh, hitching their financial interests onto other, we'll call them adjacent things that, that sound really nice, like social justice, but then, but, but actually perverting it essentially and taking it somewhere else. And there's human fallout from that. That is addiction, that's broken homes. There, there's, there's tremendous fallout from this. And that's what I clean up. I see that every day in clinics, in treatment. And I just, I just could not stand back and let this happen with it, with at least not speaking up. Well, I, I certainly welcome you to share what are some of your experiences then, both as a psychologist being in a state that has legalized recently, just up January 1st, what, what's been some of your experience with marijuana? Yeah, yeah. Well, so I've, I've had some of my own experiences, and then I did actually prepare a couple of slides that I could show you. I guess just speaking from, from the Illinois perspective, um, it's it's been something where uh, we, you know, you, you, you talk ahead of time about how the, this information rolls down to children. And I heard with my own ears in February in one of the adolescent treatment programs that I was overseeing as a hospital director at the time, a kid say, well, it's, it's legal now. So it must, so it's fine. What's the big deal? Everybody's doing this. And this was a 16 year old kid in drug treatment. And so, I mean, from an access perspective, from a messaging perspective, from a health and safety perspective, there are just so many really concerning implications. And I'm going to throw up some slides here that I think I, that I know have been very useful for me and my understanding, both uh, of my own experiences in the state, but then also this nationally. Um, just to talk a little, a little bit about things that I think would be useful for uh, our listeners today to, to know as well. So the, the first thing that I think is really important to, to recognize is that this push is being driven by the marijuana industry. That both includes the medical side of this and the commercialized side of this. Um, there's a lot of money to be made. And I, I'm sure Luke will talk more about this, but, but Sam is very plugged into and monitoring where that money is coming from and going. But people don't recognize that you can actually, if we're talking say about uh, the, the, the criminal justice system, you can, there, there's more choices than simply having this commercialized for-profit addiction market and full-on prohibition. You can decriminalize it, you can legalize possession, you can have a state run program so that ideally, you know, the state isn't thinking as much about profits as a, a again, for profit industry that has shareholders and such. Um, th those are very different constructs. People don't recognize that. And they think that this is literally just about, say, like keeping people out of jail. Um, a really interesting dichotomy that I want to I want to point out is that before we were, when we were leading up to the vote in 2019 here, six and 10, uh, there was a, a, a Cook County only, so Chicago only poll that basically asked, do you want marijuana re re uh, legalized, yes or no? And when you do that, and, and, and advocates knew exactly what they were doing, they got a six and 10 yes. Because when you ask it in that way, particularly in that population, that's what you get. However, another poll, 
actually that Sam, uh, that Sam ran through Mason Dixon, very, very well recognized group, found that when you educate people and tell them what the current policy is here in Illinois, that we've decriminalized it and we have medical marijuana, that support rate dropped from 66% to 23%. And, and even in Cook County, that number dropped to 36%. So all you actually have to do is talk to people about what's really going on and immediately the script flips when you actually inform the public instead of mislead them. That the, the justice thing, was, I think the amount of people in prison in Illinois was half of 1% for marijuana, low level marijuana possession. And it's because we'd actually decriminalized it years ago, but I was on uh, panels with state senators where they were almost pretending as if that wasn't the case because that, that, that sounded better. So it's really critical that people understand it's not an all or nothing sort of thing. And the issue is that these changes in policy have led to huge upticks in particularly in, in marijuana vaping amongst youth. And that has the most significant implication actually on the health of youth. And we're gonna talk about that in, in just a second as well. Um, but it's been going way, way, way up. And marijuana use itself, daily use has been going up in younger grades and actually some different and more recent data has shown it going up in general. But it's not just under 18. The biggest population that grows in use is over 18. That was another thing we heard a lot in, um, in Illinois is that this is just taking a black market into a, a white market per se. Um, it, it's, it's not, it, it generates new users because now you have a capitalistic, you have a for-profit industry pushing a product out. And what, you'll, what you see time and time again is that as you uh, normalize use and increase access, more people use. And the more people who use again, and this is why I speak out on it, the more people who end up in our clinics who need help. The biggest reason for this is adjusting what's called a perceived risk <clears throat> or level rather a perceived risk. So in the drug world, there is a direct relationship between how risky you feel it, it is to use a substance and how much, uh, how many people are going to use it. That's why, for example, most people don't say start with heroin because they see that as much riskier than marijuana where you hear all of these tropes, these misleading tropes, like things like it's not addictive. It's absolutely 100% physically addictive and psychologically as well, just like alcohol is. Slow, but absolutely it, it, it's addictive. That it's natural, that it's just a plant, that it's not as bad as something else, as if that's a, a reason to do anything. Um, you, you hear all these things and what that means is that it's lowering that perceived risk. And on the left here, you can see that these are for kids, 12 to 17, that if they perceive great risk in binge drinking, they're, they're, they're less likely, actually they're twice as likely to binge drink if they don't perceive a, a great risk. And the same thing goes for marijuana, but that's 15 times higher. I mean, kids feel like something's a great risk, they don't do it. And all of these industry efforts are to uh, make, that, make, make that balance shift. This is an example of it. There was a, this Buffalo Grove days, I'm, I'm local to Chicago, uh, suburbs of Chicago, in, in my neighborhood, there's a, a fair called Buffalo Grove days and the local marijuana dispensary was handing out their hats to children. And when they had an opportunity to respond to this in the paper, they basically didn't. They said, well, marijuana is good for kids uh, medically as well. So, you know, we'll primarily direct it. There was, there was no apology here. They, 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 they had the opportunity, they didn't do it. I don't know if you guys caught this, but this was countdown to 2018. Some, this was a reporter in Denver on a pot bus um, with a bong gas mask. And these are the sorts of things, again, that the more we normalize this sort of behavior and doing it, the more people who are going to do it. And it's worth mentioning, this is not like just a marijuana thing. If there was, uh, if there was an effort, a campaign going on to lower the risk of methamphetamine, I'd feel the same way, even of alcohol. I'd feel the same way because all of these things, we do not want more intoxicated people. We do not want more addicted people. And so any efforts to get more people addicted to new drugs or old drugs is from my opinion, unwelcome. Now, part of why there's misunderstanding is that marijuana has changed over the years. And I think a lot of people don't recognize this. Woodstock pot was three to 4% THC. And you can see here, this blue line has been climbing for decades. Um, and CBD actually, it's cannabidiol, this is the green one, the one that's a little more associated with any sort of health benefit, has actually been dropping on average. And this is from uh, DEA seizures. The legal market is actually even more potent than the illegal market. This was a study just came out a couple months ago looking at all these states where it's either medically or recreationally legal. 
And, th and these pie graphs show the percentage where there's THC for the products over 15%. That 15% mark is in Amsterdam where they draw the line between a hard drug and a soft drug. So 15, that's you know arbitrary, sure, but that's where they draw the line. And you can see, particularly in these states down here, I mean, virtually everything is this really intense THC. And what they found was that- that, if Dr. Juan, I don't mean to interrupt, but I, I think, especially I hear from pro marijuana lobbyists that the potency hasn't changed over the years. It's been oh. the same. And you know, I, I've literally had those lobbyists tell me on talk shows and whatnot, that that is not the case, that potency has not changed. I mean, looking at this, what you're seeing here, it absolutely has. And, and I just wanted to emphasize that and any, any further points about that. Yeah, well, ab absolutely. And even this one, right? The potency has been changing even before. This is just black market. It's been going up. This is about selective breeding. This is about pe people, again, really trying to get high as fast and as effectively and with as much of a punch as possible. And it's also about tolerance because the more people use it, the more they have to use to get the same effect. But Woodstock pot would be in this blue category, the less than 5% THC. And you can see it's basically not even being sold anymore. It's, it's the vast minority. The average pot right now, that's a leaf pot. Medical and, and just medical dispensaries is 19.2. And in recreational, the average is 21.5. And it's important to mention that there's no actual difference between medical marijuana and recreational marijuana. This is just a distribution of products sold. So it's the same exact stuff that's sold for both. Um, just like there's no uh, rec like a f f uh, medical Norco and fun Norco. You know what I mean? Like they're, they're all just opioids. It's the, it's the same basic idea. Now, it's important to recognize, and we've started, we've, it was at least one article about this that I saw in Chicago as well, um, that in Colorado, ED visits tripled after legalization. And there are two reasons for that. One was marijuana-induced psychotic breaks, and we'll talk about that in a second. But the other was something called cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome, which is where you have too much THC in your body, you're vomiting uncontrollably, and you cannot stop. And for anyone who said uh, weeds never killed anybody, um, it has. Absolutely, it's killed people, uh, even directly. This is a, uh, I took this right out of USA Today, uh, an Indiana teen, 17 years old, who died from dehydration secondary to cannabis, hyper, uh, cannabis hyperemesis syndrome. Um, There's also plenty of people who have died in car crashes, uh, burned their house down, and actually uh, suicide as well is associated with marijuana use. If anyone wants to read a very affecting article, um, head over to uh, uh, johnnysambassadors.org. It's a nonprofit looking to educate kids about uh, marijuana. The, uh, the person who started that nonprofit lost her son to a marijuana related suicide last year. He had a marijuana psychotic break, induced psychotic break two years ago, struggled with it, and then jumped off a building. Um, after relapsing on marijuana two years later. So uh, again, it's, it's something where it, it sounds really nice that marijuana never killed anybody, sounds really attractive, but it's also not true and the facts need to matter. Now I wanna talk about psychosis again for a second because this is one of the most concerning uh, pieces of data that we're finding uh, replicated in the clinical literature and also something where pot advocates like to cry mer uh, reefer madness. They like to cry that this is some sort of moral panic and that's what's going on here. And that's, that, that's very disingenuous because even, just because something might have happened 70 years ago doesn't mean that studies that are published in Lancet Psychiatry, one of our most prestigious journals, don't matter, that you can just brush it aside because it's inconvenient. What we found, what the study found was that if you use marijuana, you're 50% more likely to have a psychotic break and you're 500% more likely, five times as likely to have a psychotic break if you use one of the concentrates, things like, uh, uh, butter, uh, B butane hash oil, wax, shatter. These are concentrates that can be over 90% pure THC and are one of the uh, fastest growing markets right now in the marijuana trade. Virtually every state that sells it uh, illegally is, is selling these. And for kids, it's what you put in vape pens. And that's part of why we're seeing these sorts of impacts. Uh, back when I was working as the director in a hospital system, in our uh, adolescent psych ward, about 40 beds, between two and five of those kids at any point in time were there for a marijuana-induced psychotic break. I was doing an assembly at a school in uh, southern suburbs of Chicago uh, before this past school year, so the 2019 school year, they'd hospitalized three kids in three weeks due to marijuana and do psychotic breaks from school. So this isn't everybody, of course, but it is quite a lot of them. And 
But one of the last things that I want to leave you with, and I know that we have to hear from Luke, we've only got a, a small amount of time, is talking about the culture of marijuana marketing, uh, both in terms of uh, medical and, and recreational, because again, there's no difference. So this is from a medical marijuana dispensary where, re, near where I work. And it's important to recognize that this is consistent across the country. So if you look in your medical dispensaries, you'll see the same thing. Look at how these substances are, are labeled and advertised. They're called things like blue cheese, Durban poison, alien rock candy, bio Jesus, flow, platinum Girl Scout cookies, uh, OG18, if you're unfamiliar with that acronym, that stands for Original Gangster, and then uh, st Strawberry Cough. And this one's advertised about how it'll make even the most seasoned consumer cough. And you might be wondering, why are we saying that medicine makes you cough? Well, that's because in marijuana subculture, there's a phrase, if you don't cough, you don't get off. You don't get high. So this is, this is literally speaking to current recreational users in a medical marijuana store. And if you go down to OG18 as well, they're saying it was the winner of the High Times Cannabis Cup in 09 and 010. If you are a 65-year-old woman with MS, that does not speak to you. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's, that's not like, oh, great. Like, they won the High Times Cannabis Cup, I'm in. You know, or like, this, that's, no, absolutely. You could call this stuff anything, right? You wouldn't know what Advil was unless somebody told you. You wouldn't know Tylenol. These, marketing is always on purpose, guys. It's always on purpose. And this is what's done every single state. People associate it with, with health, and then they go in a different direction. Oh, here, here's another one that they were selling in the medical dispensary, green crack, 27% THC. Now recreational as well, but again, what, what are we promoting with these sorts of products? One in four 12th graders, according to the Monitoring the Future study, said that they would increase or use more or try it if it were legalized. And I wanna leave you with this and then tell you a little bit more about what happened in Illinois. If, I don't know if these look familiar, but this is what the cigarette industry did. More doctors smoke camels than any other cigarette. 20,000 physicians say luckies are less irritating. This is showing, if you look at these figures shadows, you can see that they've got jowls and they're basically saying, don't gain weight as you age by smoking because nicotine is a stimulant. So basically speed up your metabolism to stay slim as you age. And scientific evidence on the effects of smoking and Chesterfield is best for me. Um, you know, probably not smiling because he's developing throat and lung cancer, but that's kind of, you know, they're, they're allying themselves with health and medicine. And so here's how this tends to work across the country. The first is you associate an addictive substance with broad medical benefit, despite the lack of evidence. And we could talk about medical marijuana for quite some time, but the Cliff Notes version is there's only a few things that have any support. Most of it is CBD and not THC. And you have dispensaries selling green crack that's 27% THC. So just I, I'll just leave it at that for now. They market explicitly or implicitly to teenagers and young adults. And then what happens is commercialization. You've got your foot in the door. You've started associating it with medicine. It makes it a lot easier to push things through. Now, it's worth mentioning that Illinois is the only state to pass it through the legislature. And part of the reason for that is we could not have a ballot initiative. They had to get it through there. Every other state, it were, uh, they've been voted down far more times than they've gotten through. But in every other state, they've had to go to ballot initiatives where they can then flood the market with money, where public health does not have the same money to buy TV ads and flyers and those sorts of things. The money essentially can, can push it through. Now, what happened here in Illinois, just to give you a little taste of this, was that this was negotiated in secret. No one was allowed in. Only the sponsors of the bill were, were, were crafting this thing with whoever they invited. I can tell you that the State Medical Association afterwards uh, felt very jilted by this and left out preventionists. I mean, none of us were let in. And then it was dropped with less than a month in the legislative session, 550 page bill. There were actually some issues with it that even proponents had problems with. And so then what they did was they dropped a 610 page revision onto another bill. Now, why this is important uh, is that because it was an amended bill that had already passed the House in our state, first of all, it already passed the House. So they drummed it onto a bill, a bill about pawnbrokers not being able to sell, sell stolen property. Because it was a revision that said, we're going to strike the old bill and put in a new one, there was no change log. So no one really had any idea where the extra 60 pages came from. Uh, it, was, it was just all in there somewhere. And then it was passed 48 hours. I was actually passed, I think, 12 hours later after they submitted it. No one had time to read this. It was just jammed through. And then because 
it was on a bill that had already technically passed the house it didn't have to go through committee it could just be a quick up and down vote on an amendment to push it through there was no debate it just went through because they'd essentially hijacked a different bill that had already passed one of the chambers so and to give you an example of what got pushed through and include things like advertising if you're doing this for public health you're not advertising pot right Adver advertising pot is to sell it um, extracts and concentrates could be sold with no THC cap, edibles, weak restrictions on product names. You could sell at 21 and up, even though we know that it actually affects the developing mind up until the age of 25. And there is no minimum distance from schools and it allows for home grows if someone has a medical card, which completely defeats the purpose of, of controlling and regulating the product and is completely unenforceable by police because now you know, they, they, they're not going to have the time to check every single house where someone's complaining of pot being, it's just, it's not, not possible. So all of that was put in there. Also worth mentioning as a, little, a nice little trailer bill, um, the Department of Public Health, the medical director of the Department of Public Health had been voting down expanding medical marijuana to bunches of new conditions that had no uh, science to support it for years. And so after they voted him out and put this through, they then added 11 new conditions through a legislative process uh, because they could do this end around the medical side. So I could tell you a lot more stories about what happened, um, but the bottom line for you guys right now is you still have a choice. And I'd encourage you to really proceed thoughtfully. Um, every state can decide how they go about working with their drug policy, but I would strongly recommend both from my own experience in Illinois and other states as well, um, that creating a for-profit industry to sell drugs is probably not the best way to go for public health and safety. And there's a lot more data we could talk about with this. Um, it's, it's really just very much, no pun intended, a smokescreen to make money for large corporate entities. So thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today, and I'm happy to take questions as we go along as well. Great. No, thank you, Dr. Weiner. And, and I think a lot of what you're saying with the commercialization is something that I'd, I'd welcome uh, Luke now in. Uh, you know, Luke comes from Colorado where, you know, you have what were 10-year-olds that are now mid-teens, 17, 18-year-olds that have now lived with the commercialization of marijuana. So Luke, I, I would very much welcome you to share just what has been the latest yeah. that we've seen in the impacting of Colorado and families there. Absolutely. Um, and actually, a couple of quick slides I'll go through and uh, kind of cover that. But Dr. Weiner, I want to thank you for that excellent presentation. Um, that was truly incredible. And, um, you know, we've thankfully, you know, had the joy of working with you over the years. And actually, he's a part of our scientific advisory board here at SAM. Um, so let me uh, share my uh, slides real quick. All right. Um, and first thing I want to say, too, is I really enjoyed coming and speaking um, at the leadership conference. I think it was uh, two years ago, I think now, or maybe, yeah, two years ago. Um, and thank you, Dan and, and uh, the Pennsylvania Family Institute folks for, for having us today and for having me uh, before. I really enjoy uh, being a part of this conversation and a part of this incredible group um, that the Pennsylvania Leadership Conference has uh, down there uh, in, in PA. So uh, my name is Luke Nefaratos. I'm the Executive Vice President at SAM. Just quickly about who we are. We're a national nonprofit, nonpartisan organization, the, the leading organization opposed to the legalization of marijuana. We're regularly in the press and in states across the country. We work a lot with um, basically every medical association out there, Academy of Pediatrics, um, affiliates in most states, um, and a number of other public health groups as well. Um, some of our achievements, just uh, to give some background, we've won and defeated legalization in dozens of states. We were undefeated at the state legislature. I was undefeated at the state legislature until Illinois uh, pulled some Springfield uh, Windy City politics and, and pulled their bill out. So Dr. Weiner, I'm sorry we couldn't pull that through for you, but we came close. Uh, but other than Illinois, we, we've been undefeated um, at the state legislatures and, and defeating this in many uh, ballots um, states as well. Um, he, uh, Dr. Weiner really did a good job of saying we have more than one options. I just wanted to point out with this issue. So a lot of people say, you know, uh, I think we've really polarized on marijuana and we think you either have to totally legalize it or just throw everybody in prison. And really we see this as being th three distinct conversations when it comes to marijuana. One is criminalization. Do we think people should go to jail, um, you know, for having a joint, you know, for example, um, uh, two is the medical discussion, you know, are there medicinal benefits to the compounds of marijuana? And three is the recreational discussion. And those three should be separate. So if you hear somebody say, well, we're throwing everybody in prison, but uh, so let's legalize recreational marijuana. That's an illogical, that, that is conflating those issues because if you don't wanna criminalize people, we can decriminalize marijuana. Um, we, there are other policies we can do 
um, to discuss uh, when it comes to criminalization, but legalizing it for recreational purposes is a totally different uh, ball of wax. And that's what we learned in Colorado because we were told, oh, you know, let's stop throwing people in jail, so just legalize it. And then we all got shocked when we realized we created this massive commercial industry in, in my state of Colorado. So um, I'm from Denver, uh, and I want to show you a few pictures that I, I've taken um, and one that a friend took to kind of tell you how it's going in Denver, Colorado right now. So I'm a dad. I'm raising an almost four-year-old daughter now, whom I love very much. I've got another daughter on the way. Uh, praise the Lord for that. And, uh, and so I'll be outnumbered. Uh, that'll be fun. Uh, but uh, I was walking into a backpack store with my um, three-year-old daughter a few, uh, about six, eight months ago now uh, in downtown Denver. And this was at the entrance of the backpack store. And for those of you who can't see, there's a little triangle THC there, but that's really the only message you have that there could be something in these little chocolate bars. This is totally legal in Colorado. And, and Colorado has laws that say, you know, you can't have child friendly advertising, child friendly uh, packaging. Uh, my daughter went up to this and grabbed one of the chocolate squares and I was going to give it to her um, and I was going to take one myself until I, I noticed, wow, there's something odd about these bars um, and I just, I couldn't believe it. So these are the kinds of things that you experience on, an, on basically a daily basis now um, in Colorado because the atmosphere is being, it is being influenced and pushed by a very aggressive multi-billion dollar uh, uh, marijuana industry. Uh, this I just took literally uh, uh, two weeks ago at the park. Okay, so took my daughter to the park. She loves to go on the swing. I'm, I'm reaching for the swing. And I look down, I'm like, what is that? And you can see the zoom in. It's a nice little THC vape um, that we have, a marijuana vape uh, that's just right here at the kid's playground. And again, my daughter was going to go swing on that swing. So these are the kinds of kind of side impacts that can't be controlled for. And we can write these bills however we want in terms of legalizing marijuana. We can say it won't be friendly to kids. You won't be able to use it in public. You're not gonna be allowed to use it around playgrounds, but you know, we don't have enough police officers and law enforcement and regulatory bodies to police every single park and playground and make sure that you know when my daughter goes to play at the playground, somebody's not gonna light up a joint or leave a, a vape pen. Um, in that area. And so that, that's where we start to see what happens to society as a result of the policies um, that we pass. And, and we really have to think very uh, carefully about that. Um, this one I did not take. Uh, this a friend of mine took and he sent to me a few months ago. This is the line uh, during the COVID lockdown. So you can see uh, they weren't really doing a great job, uh, no masks or anything like that. Um, not necessarily uh, you know, safe on a lot of levels, but you got a little toddler here waiting in line with his mom and looks like maybe a baby in the stroller outside of a pot shop. Uh, and, and this is absolutely totally normal here in Colorado. So, so this is the impact again on culture that you have to think about and the impact on youth as Dr. Weiner very eloquently stated. So I've got a few slides I wanna jump through in terms of just some quick hit stats um, and then you know happy to take questions, Dan, we can talk more. But Dr. Weiner mentioned potency. We're seeing these concentrates. These are gummies, candies, dabs. If you've heard of this dabbing, um, all this stuff now, the average has gone from a 3% to a 20%. Concentrates, we're seeing that average now up to over 55%, which is significant. Um, and we're seeing products regularly in the 90 to 99% potency range, which is, this drug is totally, anything you think about marijuana before, forget it. It's a totally different drug. The industry has totally changed and altered it. Um, and we're talking about a totally different uh, experience now. And it's much more addictive. So there was a 25% increase in marijuana addiction among youth in legal marijuana states. So you cannot deny it. You legalize marijuana in your state. Every state's experience that's legalized it has seen an increase in marijuana addiction among youth. And again, just so we know, it says cannabis use disorder here. That is the scientific diagnosis code for marijuana addiction. So doctors and scientists unanimously, universally, 100% agree marijuana is addictive. You can be addicted to marijuana. So I just want to make sure that's clear. Yeah, Luke, um, if I could emphasize this, because yeah. I think this is a point we're hearing in Pennsylvania. Like, what yeah. are the sources for this? Because I think obviously with legalization, yeah. is that influencing? And I think obviously right here, you're saying that. So what, where are sources or what, where, where can we find, you know, that seeing that increase? Yeah, so you can look up this study, the Serta et al. study, uh, 2019, highly uh, cited that'll talk to you about some of this addiction increase. Um, in terms of marijuana's addictive uh, potential, I encourage you to go to every major public health uh, website that you can find. Um, you know, CDC, NIDA, National Institutes of Health, they've all got, um, you know, uh, reams of research studies. And Dr. Weiner, I don't know if you wanted to chip in on that. 
Yeah, yeah, that's that's why I turned my camera back on. Thanks for letting me pop in. So, so that's like really common myth, and I alluded to that briefly in my section as well. That people are saying it's not addictive. Um, it is actually the second most common substance that we treat in drug rehab in this country behind alcohol right now. Um, we have verifiable physical tolerance and then withdrawal syndromes. And that's one of the hallmarks of addiction is when you're, you don't have it anymore. Your body's what's called already down-regulated. So taken out some of the uh, endogenous cannabinoids that you have. So you go into withdrawal and you experience those behaviors. And we've seen that actually in rats and mice. We've seen that in humans. It's very well documented. And if anybody has any questions about that, I think I saw one in the q and I'm, I'm happy to send out journal articles. Uh, there, there are many of them uh, that, that support this. So I really just wanna put that to rest. The one last thing I'll say about it, I think that people push this myth forward because again, it's addictive like alcohol's addictive, not like something like heroin's addictive. It's not like you're gonna smoke a joint and then all of a sudden you can't stop. It's something that you start doing habitually, you start doing socially, then you start doing to cope with problems in your life, start to feel more relaxed. And somewhere along the way, your body goes over a trigger point and then you're addicted. That's exactly how alcohol works. Um, it's the same general addictive model, but for whatever reason, we all seem to agree that alcohol is addictive. Well, generally the people promoting marijuana and sales of marijuana, again, that's the perceived risk part coming in again, to try to cast shade on this question, even though there's zero controversy. Right. Hey, add, and I guess Dr. You, Weiner and, and, and Luke, sorry, I, I, I welcome both of you. What does that really look like? I, I think when it comes to the, when we say kids are getting addicted to this, I think when you have a premise that it's harmless, you think, well, what, what's the problem if somebody's becoming addicted? What does that actually look like? I guess, Dr. Weiner, in your experience, or even Luke, you know, in Colorado, what do we mean when we say it's an addictive drug? What does that look like? Yeah, well, I, I can start and then I'll pass it back off to Luke. Um, so it, it can take a lot of different forms. I, I actually think uh, that, that Sam actually has a couple of um, uh, videos on their website uh, from testimony from, from uh, young people who have been addicted to marijuana or telling their story. There's also uh, on YouTube, you can look it up. I think it's called, um, if you type in like marijuana hidden addiction or something like that, I'll find it later. There's a, there's a short documentary on someone about their struggle with marijuana addiction as well. But basically anytime you're addicted to a drug, your life starts to center around it. It becomes the nexus of your social activities, it becomes how you deal with problems, you're doing it on a regular, a pretty much a daily basis. It starts to take precedence over other things in your life, even when you start to have consequences there in terms of work, family, school, uh, whatever the case is, you basically start valuing putting the substance in your body over those other things in your life, even when there are, start to be consequences. And then of course, when you take it out, many people again experience those cravings. They might have dreams, withdrawal symptoms can involve uh, sleep disruption and irritability, headaches. Some people have shakes, although that's a little bit less, less common, um, but you have a actual physical withdrawal sy syndrome as well. So I guess that's that's probably how I'd, how I'd put it. I don't know if you wanna add anything to yeah, it. Yeah, and I would just add that, you know, then there's obviously the public health impacts of regular marijuana use. So if you become addicted, you're, um, you know, and you're regularly using marijuana, you're, according to the Lancet Journal of Psychiatry, you're five times more likely to develop psychosis, schizophrenia. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about some other studies among youth, but if you're starting it and addicted in your youth, I have some slides here um, that talk about kind of the increases there. Um, we uh, see a significant increase in your likelihood of, you know, permanent IQ loss, um, uh, mental health issues, depression, suicidality, um, all of those things are extremely high risk factors for, for um, regular use of marijuana and addiction. And I'll say one more thing before I turn myself back off again, because this can sound really alarmist, but it's actually true. I mean, I, and I think that's, that's part of the, the, the struggle here is that sometimes you say this stuff and people are like, wow, you're just using scare tactics. But we have so many neuroimaging studies on what Luke is talking about in terms of actual like physical changes to the brain that are permanent. If you start to use this before the age of 25 and particularly if you're a teenager and then those cognitive implications, like it's replicated, it's there. It's, I mean, there, there's so much of it. And I, I think sometimes when folks look at what health, health experts are saying and compare that to we'll call it the general public discourse, which has been largely shaped by big money from these corporations. They're like, well, you can't be, this can't be right, right? Everybody's saying this other thing. And I just really want to support that what Luke is going to tell you, what we're, we're telling you, not only is it true, but we're happy to provide those scientific references to help well, back. Yeah. And, and just to add on to that too, I think a lot of people think of heroin and cocaine and these other, you know, quote unquote, harder drugs 
as being like you use it once and you get addicted, get addicted right away. That's just not the case. It's very much varied across users. There are people who use uh, these hard drugs, heroin, cocaine several times and don't get addicted. So um, again, it's, the marijuana is no different than any of the other drugs where some people will use it and maybe they don't become addicted right away. Some people will use it and maybe they do become addicted right away. Um, so there's no kind of hard set scientific rule that you use any of these drugs and you'll immediately become addicted, but they all are addictive drugs. And it's just important we point that out. Yeah. All right, turn myself off. <laughs> oh, no, no, it's good. Thank you, Dr. Aaron. Um, so I'll, I'll go through, I just have a couple more slides here. So I was talking about that youth increase in use. So in Colorado, our um, Department of Public Health and Environment just documented that uh, kids age 15 and younger, uh, as of last year, it's a 15% increase in uh, monthly use of marijuana. So um, that is a very concerning increase. We saw increases across the board among youth, 16, 17, 18, older. Um, so we, we continue to see these increases in the state, um, which are very con concerning. Now kind of going to the national level, um, across the, the nation, we're now seeing a, uh, about 699,000 youth, 12 to 17, are developing an addiction to marijuana as of 2019. So that is a huge increase, um, just even looking at the past decade in, in, in marijuana use. And of course, it's it's because some of these states have, have chosen to legalize marijuana. We're seeing a, a permissive environment, a promotion of it by an industry. Um, and a couple of final thoughts I wanted to leave you with, um, kind of um, going away from youth for a second. The workplace statistic that, that just came out from Quest Diagnostics a couple of weeks ago, if you haven't seen them, you should look them up. Quest Diagnostics does the, the, stud, the tests for basically all major employers, um, and they found almost triple digit percentage increases in a number of the, the um, legal marijuana states and double digit percentage increases in all, in, in, in all of them. So, I mean, you look at this, Nevada, 142% increase in workplace uh, positivity for marijuana. So people are going to the workplace high in record numbers. Um, since legalization in, in these states. So that's a big uh, concern for the workforce. Pregnant mothers, we're seeing um, continued study after study after study. This is just the latest study that came out that I encourage you to check out, finding more and more pregnant mothers are using marijuana um, and that this is, uh, it comes with a host of risks um, for, the for the mother as well as um, especially for the child. Um, it actually has led to uh, the death of a child in the womb um, already, the use of marijuana, and this um, also leads to low birth weights. Um, other issues, which um, actually the Surgeon General has talked about um, several times. And so the final slide I want to leave you with too is on the roads. So in Colorado, we saw there's about a 260% increase in, in youth um, who are driving stoned, um, which they admitted to doing um, in a survey. So that is a big concern. Uh, but they, there was a research study done in JAMA um, by Dr. Russ Kamer, who's a good friend of Sam and um, excellent uh, doctor and researcher, they are predicting a 7,000 more stone driving deaths a year nationally um, if the, the nation were to legalize. And to put that into context for you, we lose about 10,000 people to drunk drivers every year in this country. So you're basically doubling that impact um, uh, roughly. So that, that is a concern we need to think about. Um, and, and so I'll just kind of leave it at that. Um, this is you know, our website, learnaboutsam.org. It's my boss, but you can reach us at info uh, at learnaboutsam.org um, as well. But happy to, to take any questions and, and discuss this further, Dan. But I think one thing we didn't go over that I want to make sure we did hit on is uh, Big Tobacco is really leading this rush to legalize. Um, so Altria Philip Morris, which is you know, Altria is the new name for Philip Morris in Marlboro. Um, they put in more than $2 billion into the marijuana industry. Um, we also have the number five biggest tobacco company on the planet, Imperial Brands, based in the UK. They put in over $100 million into the marijuana industry. So if you want to see who's pushing to legalize, it's it's not people who are interested in liberty. It's not people who are interested in kind of personal choice and, you know, what you do in your own home, who, you know, I don't care about that. That's not what this is about at all. Um, it's about people who want to sell drugs. They want to get more people addicted. They've already changed this drug. Uh, you know, it, this, drug, this drug can never go back to what it was. It, it's a totally <clears throat> different drug than it's ever been. Um, and so this is a totally different uh, landscape we're talking about now. Yeah, I'd like to point, that's a great point, looking at that you know, investment that's made by those huge companies. What's been the impact, you know, you, that picture of the, the jewel vape pen under the swing? I mean, from what I'm seeing, it seems like in legal states, the vaping of teens is astronomically going up. And, and so what, what are we seeing the impact especially in a legalized state for recreational use with vaping? 
Yeah, great question. Um, and so and actually, I have slides in another presentation I could have used for this, but um, in Colorado, we just had a report released a few weeks ago that found da uh, uh, vaping for youth, uh, youth vaping of marijuana has gone up, I think it's triple digits in terms of percent. Um, so it's, it may be doubled or even tripled. I mean, youth are using vape pens to, to vape marijuana more than ever before. It, it's, it's, it's astronomical, the increase we're seeing. And what's interesting is vaping is a brand new technology that just kind of came out over the last few years. So they've only really started looking at this in the research just in the last, I think, two or three years. That's the base mark year is, I think, 2018 or 2019. So um, we're just going to continue to see these numbers uh, rise. I think with the vaping crisis that took place, Hopefully nobody has forgotten about the vaping crisis that took place late last year. That crisis continues. The CDC has not identified what the reason was for this crisis. Um, some of us heard about vitamin E, uh, acetate, that was part of it, but there still continue to be cases. We just saw some new cases in Michigan, Minnesota, and Wisconsin where people got this debilitating lung illness from, from their vape pens. So that continues to happen. And a lot of people don't know this, but 80 plus percent of the vaping cases uh, the, of this vaping illness uh, were from marijuana vapes. Um, and a number of them, about one in six, were um, obtained from commercial marijuana sources, so from the marijuana industry. So it's very important that we note the link between this industry, which is supposedly regulated, right? We, we, a lot of people, I think, kind of come to this and say, look, I don't like marijuana, I don't want people to use it, but why don't we just legalize it, get rid of the drug dealers and regulate this and so that nobody gets hurt, basically. Um, and what we've seen is, you know, immediately in just a, a handful of years of having legalization, we have this nationwide marijuana vaping crisis, people getting ill, getting these, these tainted products from legal regulated sources. Um, so I think we should kind of dispense with this notion that we're regulating, uh, you know, drugs properly, that we can regulate uh, drugs properly. That's just not the way it works, um, what we've seen historically with alcohol, tobacco, and opioids, which I know Pennsylvania is the uh, paragon of how great opioid regulation is going. Or so I, I hear. I, I certainly would welcome, uh, you know, Dr. Weiner, I think you have extensive experience with opioid use disorder and, and treating those. And, and so what Luke is mentioning, certainly in Pennsylvania, that has been a huge problem that we've had. And, you know, Lieutenant Governor Fetterman would say that it would be a reduction in that problem if we would legalize marijuana. What would be your words to our Lieutenant Governor and really your experience that you've seen with marijuana and as a treatment for opioid use disorder. Yeah, well, so speaking to, the, to that point directly, and, and I should mention as well, like when we're talking about harms related to opioid use disorder, no one's saying, well, let's go set up some like heroin and fentanyl shops. You know what I mean? Like we're, no one's suggesting that as a, as, as a solution. So I think it's also important to look at that. that. But in, in terms of actually impact on the opioid use uh, on, on the opioid epidemic. So what, what we've seen actually, there was a study that, that, that pot advocates really liked to, to trot out there about how in, in states where they allowed people to use marijuana and sub that in for opioids for pain, there was a 25% drop in mortality. Uh, that data, however, only went up to 2010. And when that exact same analysis was rerun, and I'd be happy to send this study to you, exact same data, like sample, exact same analysis, but instead now it looked at from the, be the beginning of the, of, the, of the longitudinal study to 2017 instead of 2010, that completely reversed. And there was now a 25% increase in opioid overdose mortality in states that allowed for that. We also have a study came out a couple of years ago that found that people who use marijuana recreationally are five to eight times more likely to develop a new opioid use uh, pill addiction, that develop a, a new addiction to opioid pills. There's another study that just came out recently. I was actually just talking about this at another event yesterday. A journal article just published that found that, ur that, that urban youth in particular, they were looking at a sample of urban youth over time, a longitudinal study found that, that ki the kids who start using marijuana in adolescence are, gosh, I don't want to give you guys the wrong number, but it was staggered. I want to say it might have been like five times more likely that they develop an, a, a, pres a prescription opioid addiction. Um, if, if they were using marijuana. So the, the bottom line is that that is a complete mirage. It sounds great. We're looking for a silver bullet, but the data isn't there. It's also worth mentioning that in terms of getting people off of other addictive substances, people have said that you can use it kind of as like harm reduction. We actually have zero data to support that on a population level. And then a bunch of different studies that show that you are less likely to stay sober from that substance if you do it. And from a treatment perspective, it actually makes a lot of sense because when you're in drug treatment, 
The drug is only part of it. There's also the reason why you're doing it in this behavioral pathway where you feel a certain way, therefore you numb out with a substance. And so if you're just swapping marijuana in as your way of numbing out, one, you're potentially putting yourself at risk of getting addicted to that, but two, that fundamental connection hasn't been broken. It makes it a lot easier to go back. So I, I would completely oppose that standpoint, both from anecdote and from evidence. Yeah, and one thing I'll just kind of jump in on that with is, this has played out in the data we've seen from states. So opioid overdose deaths have gone up 23% across all states that have legalized marijuana. So not saying that you legalize marijuana and that causes opioid overdose deaths to go up, but what we do know is it's not causing over, uh, opioid overdose deaths to go down. It's not solving this problem. As we in Colorado were frequently promised, um, as well as I know in Illinois and, and elsewhere. So that's a key data point to look at. And I will say in Colorado, year over year, every single year since legalization, uh, we've seen steady increases in the raw numbers of people overdosing on, on opioids and dying. So that just continues to be a problem here. And we just hit our record. Um, it's, uh, what is it, September? We just hit our record as a state for opioid overdose deaths. So we're going to set uh, everything from here to the end of the year is going to be expanding that that uh, record. And it's all over the newspapers here in Colorado. Well, even just to emphasize that, you know, Lieutenant Governor Fetterman is saying we should go full on Colorado. You're saying Colorado is leading the nation in opioid use. Death. Obviously, not necessarily the direct correlation with marijuana, but obviously what you're saying, yes, it's not obviously yeah. helping. It's not helping. No, it, it's not. And, you know, and Fetterman, you know, he, he is going around saying, you know, let's go full Colorado. Let's, you know, there's going to be zero deaths. You, you read his tweets and it kind of, I'm sorry to say this, but it seems like he's just like a college troll account on Twitter. I mean, I, I don't know what he's doing for your, for your state and maybe somebody can fill me in on that, but it seems like he's really interested in drugs. Um, and, and so, you know, it's really unfortunate that he's putting these very, very irresponsible messages. And I just would encourage anybody who listens to something he says to ask somebody from a legal state how it's going. You can even ask our former governor, Democrat, John Hickenlooper, who ran for president now is uh, running for U.S. Senate here in Colorado. He'll tell you the marijuana money is a drop in the bucket. They're not making any money off of marijuana. He'll tell you that the regulatory burden has been insane for the state. He always has to talk about marijuana when he was governor, um, and he didn't want to be dealing with marijuana. He wanted to be dealing with more important subjects. He will tell you that himself. Um, even though he's, he, at the end of the day, if he had to vote on legalization, he probably would vote for it now, um, and he would tell you that, but he has been the first one to say there's a whole bunch of false promises, and you shouldn't listen to the, these, these promises from, uh, from advocates. Yeah. Well, this is great material. I appreciate you both. We just have a few more minutes. I know there's some questions and I guess one I wanted to hit on, I think, you know, oftentimes we see our elected officials in states that, you know, it needs to go through our legislators, which is the case here in Pennsylvania. You know, often that legislators will ignore some of this evidence, some of this data. You know, why is that the case and really what could people do about that? Uh, I'd welcome both of you just giving, you know, your two cents on that. Mm -hmm. Well, I, so I, I'll, I'll be interested to hear Luke's response to this, but it's because he has far more experience on the political side than I do. But what I can tell you is that I, I personally was, was very frustrated by that, by that exact principle, where I would bring in journal articles uh, in front of a state legislator who'd be like, there's a controversy about it being addictive. And I said, well, actually, as the director of an addiction service line, a licensed clinical psychologist, and someone who has all of these journal articles, I can tell you there's no controversy. And then they'll go out and say the exact same thing the next day. Or I was at a Senate hearing talking about use rates. And one of the co-sponsors of the bill said that, that, it, that use rates do not go up. And knowing that she would say this, I actually brought the survey that she was misciting with me and read right off of it that what she was saying was not true. And then she was still out saying the same thing the next day. And so what that tells me is that this is not about facts, that this is about politics and probably also that this is about money. And so I'll definitely defer to Luke about the best way to get change and to, to work on this issue because Sam has had a lot of success pushing back against big marijuana all and getting these bills voted down time after time after time because they're not in the public interest, they're in corporate interest. Uh, but it, it really does feel a lot of times like there's folks who just simply aren't persuadable because there's something else going on in the background that you as an expert or you as someone just with data, you're not going to make a dent in that. So uh, with that, I'll, I'll, I'd love to hear Luke's thoughts on this because yeah. that's the nice. Well, I'll start with a comment. I just, I, I mean, I frankly have found it really, really comical that uh, in an era where we're being told to listen to science over politics when it comes to COVID-19, you know, and we all know who's saying that, you know, facts, you know, not politics, right? And in an era where we're being told climate change, listen to the scientists, not politics, right? So we're, we're being scolded on those things. 
Uh, but then the very people who typically say that kind of message, and we all know who they are, uh, are the very people who seem to be completely ignoring the scientists and, and the public health experts when it comes to marijuana. And it really seems like the only thing that matters with marijuana is the politics. And politics is overruling uh, and money and lobbyists are overruling the scientists and public health experts. I, I just had a, um, a, a meeting with the governor yesterday um, where we brought a, uh, a world-renowned neuroscientist onto the call and said, look, you've been talking a lot about uh, listening to the scientists on COVID-19 and making policy decisions based on that. Um, we hope you'll listen to the scientists on this issue because here's a Harvard professor neuroscientist who's going to give you some, some feedback on marijuana. So if we listen to the scientific community on this, there's really not a lot of diversity of opinion. The scientific community is pretty much uh, resolute that uh, commercializing and expanding marijuana use is a terrible idea, um, comes with untold harms for the country. That, that's not an open question in, in science. Um, it's really pretty much an established fact. So, um, you know, really the, the key here in politics, and we all know this on the call, I think a lot of people on here probably even have more political experience than I do. Uh, but, you know, the, the, the point is this, need the facts, need to remind politicians of the stance they're taking. Uh, but then number two is we need to show them that we're serious about it. So that means bringing the moms, bringing the mothers of children who have been addicted, um, bringing the, the family members uh, impacted, uh, bringing yourself and, and communicating your concerns directly to your legislators. Um, that's the, the way to make people listen is when they see you and hear from you enough. Because I will tell you the number one thing I hear in state capitals, and I've been across almost all of our nation's capitals at this point, believe it or not. Uh, but uh, it, in fact, the funny thing was I had never been to my own state capital in Colorado, but I've been to so many others. So I just went to that one for the first time last year. Uh, but uh, I, I, I will say this, the number one thing I hear is uh, legislators tell me they hear from one or two potheads all the time. And they, they get so sick of dealing with it. And that's where a lot of the pressure points come from. So if we could just get one or two people for every legislator to be a squeaky wheel, um, that will push back on this kind of notion that, oh, wow, you know, I'm just going to keep getting hassled to legalize marijuana for the rest of my career. All right, and that's a great point. I would say, you know, we have Governor Wolf at a press conference saying, I don't see how anyone can see marijuana as addictive. Hopefully, all, the, all you listening, you know, going through this type of presentation, you're, you're learning that there are implications of, of marijuana uh, that are of great concern. So we appreciate you sharing uh, the, these types of presentations. That's what's needed. We need to educate both elected officials and your community. And so thank you for doing that. To Dr. Weiner, Luke, thank you so much for joining. This has been great. We'll include in the description uh, as a follow-up of this, uh, there's some additional uh, webinars that you guys have done that I, I certainly would recommend. We'll include those links. But again, thank you so much, everyone, for, for being a part of this discussion. Thank you to the Pennsylvania Leadership Conference for all that you're doing for, for this opportunity. And uh, again, all the best yeah. to Dr. Weiner, Luke, all the best to what you're doing. Keep on doing it. And we'll, we'll continue to advocate here in Pennsylvania. Dan, thank you. Scott, thank you for helping with this Pennsylvania Leadership Conference. It's an honor to be a part of this um, and hope to be back soon. Yeah, likewise. Thank you. All thank right. you all. Take care.